Hear the word of the Lord. Of old you spoke in a, in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm shall also strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. In my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever. And my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. Good morning. It is good to be again in the house of our God. Welcome to Frankfurt Methodist Church. Good morning. Uh, let's see, for announcements, um, you do have the pastoral visitation cards in the back on the back table. Um, scholarship forms are also available on the back table. Today, after service, we will gather at the altar to pray, to seek the Lord's guidance regarding our disaffiliation vote, which that will happen at 2 p.m. today. All members who are present will be able to vote on our disaffiliation from the United Methodist uh, denomination. Um, let's see. Are there any other? We got choir practice this week, or is it the one done Chill Coffee still? Uh, this is the final practice dress rehearsal for anyone in choir that wants to join us. Um, then we'll resume the first week of May here on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. So this Wednesday, 6 30 at St. Mary's. And like I said, first week of May, we'll be back here. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. No more announcements. Praise song, page 176. Majesty, worship his majesty. And our opening hymn will be 368. My hope is built. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, now we'll do our responsive reading from Psalm 22. Again, um, for our responsive readings recently, we've been hovering right around that 22, 23, 24 range. There's a reason for that. Psalm 22. Um, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. For kingship belongs to the Lord. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Psalm 22, as we remember, is a picture of the suffering servant. Um, uh, Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet, David writes, 750 years before Jesus is born. Psalm 22 is a picture of the crucifixion. And if you go through it, you will find no less than five Very overt references to the crucifixion. More if you dig deeper. Psalm 23, we read last week for our responsive reading. Everyone knows Psalm 23. It's the picture of the great shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 24 is the the praise of the great king. His throne shall be exalted forever. Um, He shall rule um, for all eternity. Psalm 22, the suffering servant. Psalm 23, the great shepherd. Psalm 24, the king and lord of glory. These three psalms are a picture of the ministry of Christ. And it is fitting that we remember them in his uh, resurrection uh, celebration. Now, uh, I should have uh, gathered our choir before I started preaching there. I'm sorry. Thank you. 
I do love those ancient hymns. All right. Uh, now we come to our prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests or praise reports, let us make them known. Yes. Tracy's mother. Do we know her, her name? Okay. Brenda, yes. Prayers for Rachel or Rachel. Who? Yes, the whole Skinner family. I did my basic at Fort Jackson as well, and uh, I can't say it was a good time, but I can say I, I, I miss it. It was. Uh... <clears throat> Any other prayer requests? Or... Yes. The Peterson family. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I saw another hand over here somewhere. Donna. We'll keep you in our prayers. Any others? I, it's so good to see so many people here. I, I, I counted earlier and I had uh, a 24 or 25 and then more people showed up and it's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Roy. We'll pray for our schools. Any other? How's Mark doing? Good. Good. Glad to hear it. There was a hand over here, I think. Maybe, maybe, what's that? Sorry? Oh, yes, Karen. Uh, my hubby and I have celebrated 49 years of marriage. Holy mackerel, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, congratulations. And Joe and Tim celebrate 55 years of marriage. Wow. <laughs> that's incredible, 55 years. Yeah, how's your mom doing? Um, she's doing pretty well. She um, had kind of a scalpy head this week, so she feels better this morning, but it's still cold, so she said, I'm not coming going out. But she expects to be here this afternoon. Good, good, good. Well, let her know we miss her. I have a phrase, the God took care of our young driver, Grace. Amen. Oh, no. Um, but airbags went off. She wasn't hurt, so. Oh, um, good. Good. The Lord is good indeed. Good. Good. I'm glad she's okay. (laughs) 
Brent and Matthew. Okay, and I saw Lee wave both hands back there a minute ago. I was distracted. <laughs> Careful, you get called on for doing that. Uh, are there any other prayer requests or praise reports? Right? <laughs> Joe. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Good. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Right? <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Thank you for, for being here. We're glad you're here. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? And of course, we need to pray for um, this afternoon. Yes. Okay. If there aren't any others, then let's go before the throne. Great God of heaven, we come into your presence with songs of joy, with with shouts of of worship, with adoration, with, with singing and with laughter, because you are risen, because death is defeated, hell and the grave are conquered, and life eternal has come. You Lord, and you alone are the source of all good things, light and love and and life and hope and peace and joy, salvation and, and richness and kindness and generosity and glory. All glory, laud and honor belongs to you. You are holy. You are good. You are worthy of our praise and our adoration and our love. You are God and you are God alone. There is none like you. There is none who compares. And so, Lord, in this moment of prayer, in this time of celebration, in this hour of worship, we bow before you. We humble ourselves in your holy presence, Lord, knowing that you are indeed here, that your presence fills this sanctuary. That we stand in the presence of God Almighty. And we do not take that lightly. You are lovely, you are holy, you are good, and we worship you. Blessed Father, we have sinned against heaven and against our fellow men. We have done those things we should not have done and we have left undone those things we should have accomplished and there is within us no peace. But blessed Lord, you tell us in your holy scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful, that you are just, that you will cleanse us of our trespasses and forgive us for all wrongdoing. And Lord, we do so. We bow in your presence, Lord, in these next few moments in this holy place at this holy moment 
Surrounded by your holy people, in the privacy of our own hearts, we make our confession before you. So blessed, Lord, through our confession and through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, we are forgiven. It is truly marvelous in our sight. And now, Lord, as a righteous and a redeemed people, we stand before you. We lift before you, Father, those requests we have spoken this morning. We lift also before you those we have kept hidden in our hearts, for nothing is ever truly hidden from you. Lord God, we ask that you would be with Matt and with Jason, with Tracy's mother and and that whole family in this difficult time, with Rachel and with Jacob. Lord, we lift before you the Skinner family and the Peterson family. Father, we lift before you Donna. Lord, we know that she's facing difficult times and that you are the answer. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bring her peace and comfort. Blessed Lord, we lift before you our schools. We lift before you those Injured or uh, hurt by the ammonia accident, we lift Brent and Matthew. And Father, in this pivotal moment in the history of Frankfurt United Methodist Church, we lift our church before you as well. Lord, whatever happens today, tomorrow, and for every tomorrow beyond that, we ask that it would be for your glory that you would be present here, that this would be your church, and that we would live and exist to serve you. Father, we ask your blessing on our nation and its leaders, and not only ours, but all the leaders of the world. In this difficult, dark, and dangerous time, Lord, we ask that your Prince of Peace would stand before all and over all and in all and through all. That Christ would be exalted. That the gospel would be preached from every street corner, from every mountaintop. And that souls would be saved for Jesus Christ, who has given himself to purchase us and to redeem us. And now, Father, as we go into the remainder of our service, we ask that you would be with us. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears and loose our tongues and soften our hearts, that we might know and speak and hear the wonderful, holy truths of your scripture. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, At this time, I'd like to ask a couple of ushers to come forward, please. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, And now, uh, if you would, please, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. Luke 24 and 13. Now, this will be a rather long reading. We're going to hit, I think, 22, 23 verses. So, um, if you'd rather remain seated, I, I certainly understand, but once you've found the place, or if you're going to follow along on the screen, if you're able, please, let us rise for the reading of Scripture. Luke 24 and 13. On that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered him and said, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? (laughs) He said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And 
Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village uh, to which they were going. Uh, He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were gathered with them, gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed and holy Lord, in these next few moments, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. A horse walks into a bar. A horse walks into a bar. The bartender asks the horse if it's an alcoholic, considering all the bars he frequents, to which the horse replies, I don't think I am. Poof, the horse disappears. Now, all of these philosophy folks out here are chuckling slightly to themselves. They realize that the horse said, I don't think I am, and therefore... Disappeared. Now, I could have explained the, the, the cogito ergo sum, the, the great philosophy by René Descartes to, uh, to prove the existence of, of man, I think, therefore I am. But if I did that before, it would be putting Descartes before the horse. Oh, come on, that was funny. <laughs> You're all wondering, why is he opening his sermon with a joke and, and not reading his notes like he ought to be doing. Go, or I'm, I'm, going, I'm going back to my notes here. There's a reason for that. Just, just there's a reason for that. This morning is the third Sunday of our Easter celebration. Two weeks ago, we stood at the tomb with Mary as Peter and John ran back to the other apostles to report what they saw. But Mary stayed behind weeping and encountered Jesus. We rejoiced with her as she exclaimed, Rabboni, and threw her arms around his neck. And we talked about Jesus' statement in John 20 and 17, where Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. We've heard that used a lot to suggest that Mary shouldn't touch him because he was, I don't know, radioactive or something? Growing up, I always thought that if she had touched him, that something would have been spoiled, Uh, that the the crucifixion or the resurrection, like, wouldn't count and you'd have to have a do-over or something. I was a stupid kid, but... Uh, But I thought that if she she had touched him, maybe he wouldn't be able to ascend to his father. But but I realized that this this is a difficult translation issue because the King James translates, do not touch me, but the ESV more correctly renders it, do not cling to me. But in that, in that focus on the word, I think we miss what else is going on here. Jesus is making a joke. Look again at the verse here on the screen. He says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Again, when I was a kid, 
I thought that you know, maybe he had to take a quick trip back to heaven to check in with the Father or something before he could conclude his mission on earth. And please forgive me if I'm the only one who didn't understand this. That, that is entirely possible, I, I will admit. But we, we read in the Scriptures exactly when Jesus ascends. Our primary text is from the Gospel of Luke, and Luke records the ascension at the end of chapter 24. And he tells us where it happened. Further, Luke himself in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, Luke is the author of Acts, in case uh, you didn't know, tells us exactly when Jesus ascended into heaven. If we pick it up at Acts 1 and 1, we read, In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. So looking again at our passage in John 20, where he says in verse 17, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, such and so. We have the timeline. We, we know when he's going to ascend. This verse, the verse where Mary yells Rabbi and, and throws herself around his neck, happens on day one. Jesus isn't ascending for 40 days yet. He's telling Mary that he's going to be ascending in like a month and a half, and she'll have to let go sometime before that. Dearly beloved, I understand that kind of joy. That kind of joy at the resurrection, at the majesty of the miracle of eternal life. Jesus was joyous too. He's, he's playing with Mary here. In the first portion of verse 15, in John 20, for example, we read, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? He knows. <laughs> he, he knows. He knows she's there to see him. He knows that she would... Um, he, he has known that she would be standing in that very spot from before the foundation of the world, but he asks because he's playing with her. He's filled with joy, and it's a pretty good joke. In our primary text, we see that again. Jesus tells the same joke in Luke 24. Picking up the story at verse 13, we read, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing them. Recognizing him, rather. In verse 13, Luke tells us that this story happened on that very day. What day? The day we were just reading about in John 20, the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week. And two of them were heading out of Jerusalem for fear of being caught by the Jews or by the Romans and being executed like Jesus had. Luke tells us that the town of Emmaus was about seven miles from Jerusalem, so it was likely not their final destination. But, but as they walk, Jesus walks up behind them. We used to do this in high school. You walk up behind somebody. I'm not saying Jesus tapped them on the other shoulder, right? But he, he walks up behind them, and for whatever reason, they didn't recognize him. But he overhears their conversation, and in, in verse 17, uh, he says, or we read, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. They stopped. They, they were having this conversation. They were walking, and they stood still. They, they, they halted in their progression. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here? And notice what Cleopas doesn't say. He doesn't say, our master and rabbi was crucified. He doesn't give any indication at all that he's a follower of Jesus Christ. But, but, but here, in verse 19, 
<laughs> in, verse, in Luke 24 and 19, we read, And he said to them, What things? Now, if you've got your Bibles open, you'll see I cut off part of that verse because I just, I wanted this slide. I just wanted this slide. Here, again, Jesus makes the same joke he made with Mary at the tomb. Woman, he said, who are you seeking? And here, on the road to Emmaus, following the two disciples who had already made their escape, Jesus makes the joke again because when a joke is good, you tell it to lots of people. You wouldn't believe how many people I've told that Descartes joke to. Not all of them left, but some did. Anyway, from Cleopas' response, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? We can infer that what's happening is a huge topic of conversation. Everyone is talking about it because they saw Jesus' miracles. They heard the stories. Many of them sought him out for healing. They heard him teaching in the temple. It was a big deal. A, a, a rabbi who can heal the sick, and feed the hungry, and, and, and I mean, there have even been rumors that he, he raised the dead. This guy doesn't hide. This guy is not obscure. He, he's, not, he's not hidden from an oral culture, people talking and, and uh, passing the news through their stories. He, he's a big deal. And, and now, here's Jesus. Here's the man himself asking, what things? It's funny. I've been asked several times if the Bible ever records Jesus laughing. Most of the film and television portrayals of Jesus depict him as somber and stern. I remember several from the 80s and 90s where I just felt bad for Jesus because he was always so sad. So when I go to the Bible to find answers, because Hollywood so often gets it wrong, the best I can come up with is Psalm 2 and 4, which reads, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And that itself is in response to the kings of the earth saying they're going to ally against him, as if they could defeat God by simply having a big army. In fact, if you search the New Testament for some form of the word laugh, almost always you'll see it's people laughing at or mocking Jesus. There, there are a few exceptions. For example, in Luke uh, 6 and 21, uh, we read Jesus saying, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. But nowhere in the New Testament do we read about Jesus himself engaging in laughter. But I, th I think it's appropriate that we read between the lines here in Luke 24 and in John 20. I, I think we see Jesus laughing very clearly. And that's the big takeaway here. At the moment of his greatest triumph, Jesus is laughing. Because it's finished, dearly beloved. The hard work of salvation is over. The cross is forever behind him. But it's not just that. We remember his dread of the cross, his dread of the crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before. His stress was so great that he sweat drops of blood. This is a, 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 a there's a hematophilic reaction where the capillaries, the, the blood pressure goes so high that the capillaries in the skin, the tiny blood vessels near the surface burst and, and blood drips out through the pores. He was sweating drops of blood. We, we remember him dreading the crucifixion and now that it's behind him. But, but it's, it's, not, it's not just that. It's not that he's relieved that the cross is finished, it's that he's celebrating the new covenant, which Jeremiah spoke about beginning in 31 and 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this 
is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Dearly beloved, Jesus is not celebrating the end of his own misery. He's celebrating the end of yours. He is risen. The debt is paid. The scales of justice are balanced and the way is open to all who would believe in him. Life has come. Death is conquered. Hell itself has been defeated. And that, dearly beloved, that is reason to laugh. <laughs> Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Great God, our Father, we are filled with joy at the thought of the resurrection. We are filled with light and life and love and peace and happiness because we know that Jesus Christ is truly risen indeed and that because he lives, we will live also. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? But all is swallowed up in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's open our hymnals, please, to page... <laughs> Ps. <laughs> now I'm laughing at stupid jokes. <clears throat> uh, to page 334, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. <laughs> I, I don't normally tell, well, at least I don't normally tell good jokes like I told at the beginning of this sermon during my, during my messages, but, but I, I, I wanted, like, sermon writing, and, and I'm, not, I'm not bragging here, I'm, I'm really not. Sermon writing is a spiritual exercise, and, and sitting in church and, and listening is a spiritual exercise. You're not an audience, you're participating in the worship of God. But I sat down to write that sermon, and I thought, man, what am I going to talk about? I've talked about this Emmaus passage several times. They've heard me read this several times. Well, I, I know that Jesus kind of makes a joke in there. Let me, let me see where I can go with that. And I wrote that sermon in one stretch. Boom, it was just done. And I looked up, and I was like, wow, where did that come from? Because it's, it's, not, it's not me. I'm, I, in fact, I got in the way of it because, because of my silly Descartes joke. But, 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 but the Holy Spirit wants us to know 
There is cause for celebration. Uh, I feel like we as, as Methodists, uh, don't get me wrong, I, I love Wesleyan theology, I, I love our, our liturgy and our, our Methodist culture, but I feel like sometimes we have this very stodgy experience like going into a math classroom and sitting down and listening to the professor talk for 45 minutes and getting up and leaving. I don't, I, I don't, that's not how church ought to be. We are, we of all people, of all people on the earth, should be filled with joy because Jesus Christ is risen indeed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, after the uh, recessional hymn, or recessional music, we'll be gathering at the altar to pray for our church. Um, uh, everyone is welcome. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you asking for your guidance for the future of our church. Lord, in all we do and say, we want to bring glory to your name. We want to honor you as our creator and our father. Help guide our hearts so that we may shine for you each and every day. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.